idea, friends. So nine people have come together as members of, let's say, assembly. And they are in the full possession, you know, the possession of full information about that subject matter. And they have consulted the scriptures beforehand. But now they have just arrived, they want to consult about this matter. What is, how do the Baha'i consultation procedure start? First of all, I'm going to do it for you. Watch me. You go and you put the picture of Abdul Baha there, meaning you say Abdul Baha is present here. You put the greatest name at that meeting, representing Baha'u'llah. You say the manifestation of God is with us now. Because if we don't believe in that, then we don't believe in anything now. <laughs> if we don't think that Baha'u'llah and Abdul Baha from the spiritual kingdom are present always, then we don't really believe in anything. If we think they are not with us and alive and haven't got the power, it means we don't believe in anything. We haven't been spiritually regenerated. We haven't been spiritualized. We are not informed. We don't have the knowledge of God. So that's why we've gone through all the trouble and go through the seven powers and through the magnet and understand the importance of prayers and meditation until you get the right power, the power of faith. You have got the power of the spirit of the faith now. You know they are with you. You want to make a decision, you are going to turn to them. Who, are, who else are you going to turn to? You have to turn to God. And we said direct intercourse, interaction, communication, is not possible. Even though you are not aware, you have to go through the channel of the manifestations of God. So the first thing you do before you start consultation, you have them present in your meeting. So in this meeting of nine people, you know Baha'u'llah is there, you know Abdul Baha is there. First of all, you know, you believe, you 100% believe they are there and they can help you. And also, you have listened to David when he read about consultation, what Abdul Baha said. You have to be uh, full of a spirit of faith, full of humility. You must consider every other person in that meeting greater than yourself. You must present your ideas with absolute self-effacement. We are never ever going to talk and discuss matters like they do it in political systems that exist in the world today. We are not going ever to start uh, arguments and debates and belittling somebody else's idea or something like that. Because we are in front of the manifestation of God, which means we are in the presence of God, we have to be aware of how we talk. And we are going to start the meeting with a prayer. Why? Because then you want the assistance of God. Where else are you going to get help from? I mean, it may be too much, but uh, when you read the book called um, From Copper to Gold, about the life of Dorothy Baker, the hand of the cause of God, you read that sometimes when she was a member of the Assem National Assembly of the United States of America, 
and they couldn't solve the problem, she would say, dear friends, let's stop. Let's read the tablet of Ahmad, which I've read for you. Nine times, nine times, nine times. Until we get the inspiration from God to solve the problem. You do not have to rely 100% on your own uh, intelligence and knowledge. You have to ask the, uh, the, you know, for the help of God. And pray for it. So when you know you're in presence of God, when you pray for assistance from God, And then you remember the talk of Abdul Baha, when he, which is printed in the Paris talks, which I showed you uh, in previous sessions when I was introducing the books. In this talk, Abdul Baha says that about the society of silence people. Meaning, he was saying for a thousand years ago, there was the society of silence people. When they had a problem, the chairman of the society would present them with the problem, and they would sit and meditate in silence. We have discussed this. We have said, you pray to God and then keep quiet, keep silent. That is called meditation. Why? So that you can hear the answer from God. Not with these ears, with the inner ears, with the ear of the spirit. Now, when the answer comes, dear friends, you see, my, this is my ex personal experience here I'm talking about. Sometimes, after you have found the full information about some, a case, you have turned to God, you have prayed, and you meditate between nine of you. Maybe one, one day, number two, suddenly the idea comes, the answer, the solution comes from the spiritual kingdom to him or her. So when we get the idea, we don't say, this is my idea. Uh, who are you to have any ideas? The idea comes to us from the kingdom of God, from the spiritual kingdom. We are spiritual beings. We have that great power through our spirit that God has given us. And we said that manifestation of God is always alive and helps us. Our Lord Jesus Christ is always alive. Our Lord Baha'u'llah is always alive. Our Lord the Bab is always alive. Our Lord Moses is always alive. Our Lord Muhammad is always alive. Our Lord Krishna is always alive. Our Lord Buddha is always alive. Our Lord Zoroaster is always alive. Uh, our Lord Laotozo is always alive. All the 124,000 messengers of God, they are all alive. And all the holy spirits, uh, sorry, spirit, uh, holy souls that they have departed from this world, they are in their spiritual kingdom, they are all alive. And they are all, we have been told in the Baha'i scriptures that one of their duties is to inspire us. So when you turn to God and you uh, pray for a solution to a problem, the idea will be inspired to you. Maybe this time to rule number two. So that number two shouldn't say, this is my idea. Should say, this is the idea that came to me. I am going to put it here in middle of you on the table. And now the next important thing should happen. Which if it doesn't happen, the 
process of Baha'i consultation gets aborted, you know, into trouble. And that is, as soon as a person gets the idea and puts it in the middle on the table, should dissociate himself or herself from the idea. Shouldn't stick with the idea, should say, all right, this is idea has come from, for me, you know, to me. I am very respectfully, politely, with absolute humility, I'm going to put it in that on the table for you to consider, and it's no longer mine. You all examine it. Then number four, for example, says, look, I have also had this idea. I am again putting it in this here. I've been inspired with this idea. I'm putting it on the table, and I'm dissociating myself from it. Now, listen to this. A lot of people make a mistake. Abdul Baha did never say, out of the clash of two personalities and two people, the spark of truth will come out. He never said that. What he said, out of clash of ideas, the spark of truth comes to existence. And the ideas wasn't yours to begin with. The idea was inspired to you from the spiritual kingdom. So out of these two, may we come to a, a combination of them. Out of them may come to another idea. And then somebody else puts suggestion and amends it. Somebody else, somebody else, somebody else, somebody else, somebody else, somebody else, somebody else until it becomes an, an idea which has been modified by everybody in that group, in that nine people. Then we said this is the LSA idea. When everybody agreed on this final idea, which is the modification of all the ideas that has been put forward, we say now we unanimously agree with this, which is a modified out of this process has come, which was wasn't anybody's anyway. And now it is the assembly group's idea, solution, which has come to us after we have turned to God, after we have uh, prayed to God, after we have meditated on it, after we have presented the ideas we were inspired with and detached ourselves from it, never insisting on any idea. And we have come to this idea of that everybody likes. That is the will of God. That is the solution to problem. If you see in an assembly meeting, somebody gives a suggestion, and then all the time persisting, no, no, I said that. You know, you have to know, well, that, then you will say they are not spiritually developed yet. Because it wasn't anything to do with you. You were inspired with that idea because you are a spiritual being, and you are detaching yourself from it and put it. It's nothing to do with you. Don't insist. Anybody who insists, who argues, who starts a, uh, you know, debate and, uh, wants to dominate that meeting, it means that they are not spiritually developed. However, once in this way, Abdul Baha says, you don't go vote for an idea. 
to begin with. You will analyze it, you get the full information, you consult the scriptures, you pray and meditate, and you modify the idea with the, everybody freely contributing to it until this has been, solution has been found. And then you don't say, it was whose idea? It was nobody's idea, it was the idea of the assembly. And that is the will of God. And everybody else in the community, masses of the people here, they are going to accept it with joy that this is from God. Nobody is allowed to come out of this meeting and say, by the way, do you know, I first gave that idea. Or somebody comes and says, do you know, I wasn't for that idea. I was against that idea. If you do that, you're out. You are spiritually out, really. Because you haven't understood the Baha'i consultation. You never outside the meeting discuss it. If you didn't agree with the idea at completely, and then eight people voted for it, and you didn't like that idea, but after eight people said it, and they said, this is LSA idea, when you come out, you say, that is my idea. You defend it, and you carry out that decision. If you don't, you're out. It means you haven't understood the Baha'i consultation yet. So whenever they say about Baha'i consultation, you remember a few things. Number one, we are a spiritual being. We are in the presence of God. We pray and we get our inspirations from the spiritual kingdom. We meditate. We humbly present the ideas we inspire to us on the table and dissociate ourselves from it. You don't hang on to it. That is mine, mine, mine. And let everybody look at it and modify it. And it needs a very good chairman to let everybody to contribute and to developing the final idea, final solution, final answer. And it is better always to arrive at the conclusion, at the final decision, unanimously. Everybody likes it. However, they said, if there are in certain circumstances that maybe eight people are for that, one person is not, then you go by the majority rule. But that is not to be resorted to all the instances. At the last instance, you go to vote. And as we said earlier, nobody allowed in the Baha'i faith to abstain from voting. It's, not, it's forbidden. You have to say either A or nay. This is the nature of the Baha'i consultation. We are going to stop now and then continue with the fresh subject. Now, dear friends, uh, we've done the Baha'i consultation in the, in the world order of Baha'u'llah. And uh, now we are going to ba go back to our chart here again. And if you look at here, focus here, if you can, you see we have the institution of the Baha'i House of Worship. I want to go now and explain this to you in detail, properly. Let's write the title of it now. The Institution of 
of the Baha'i House of Worship. The institution of the Baha'i House of Worship. Now, we are going to solve a lot of problems with this. And this is also connected with establishing a more were uh, more advanced civilization on Earth. It is also going to solve the economic pro problems of the planet. And it is going to solve the uh, conflict, meaning conflict resolution. But before I start, that, I just said, conflict re resolution. Let me tell you this in brief and pass by that, because you will see it in your course notes, and you think I haven't covered it, which I have really covered it. You see, all the conflicts that in the world happens, in my personal opinion, is because the individuals or organizations, which made of individuals anyway, they are not spiritually developed. They have not been regenerated. And they have not been given the guidance of God naturally. And then they misbehave. What are the nature of the conflicts usually? One of the greatest causes of conflict is money. We don't say in the Baha'i faith, oh, money is not necessary. Yes, of course, money is something necessary uh, in life. However, you should not be attached to it. If you know that, uh, uh, for example, there is a trouble in a company because there is a conflict between the investors there and the uh, company directors, investors, and the workers. Let's see how Baha'u'llah solved the problem. They came to Baha'u'llah, uh, to, sorry, to Abdul Baha, and they, when he was in the West, and said, what do you think is the divine solution to the problem of a strikes? A strike is a conflict, isn't it? Conflict between capitalists and the laborers, workers in that company. Company is a... Uh, has got a separate identity this is of its own legal identity. Now, in this company, some people have invested money, and some people work in that company to get salary or wages. Sometimes the laborers and the workers, they want extra money. Company says, I'm not giving you extra money. There is a conflict there. But it is about money. When they came to Abdul Baha, he said, Let's, you must go to the solution to the divine law. What is the divine law? You see, that's why I'm saying you have to be a spiritually regenerated. We said a human being, mainly, really, the most important thing about the human being is the human spirit and soul. Now. The main thing about another person is also the spirit and soul. We are really creatures of the same God. Shogri Afandi says, the guardian says, the spiritual relationship should be stronger than blood relationship. Meaning, 
once you become believers, your relationship is stronger than your, your own family. And if you really become spiritually regenerated, every other human being is closer to you than your family. Or you will uh, treat everybody just like your father, mother, brother, sister, uh, wife, uh, children, depending on their age. So he says, let's find the solution of a strike in the divine law. Now he says, the investors are human beings and the laborers are human beings. Let's be just. Let's look at the divine law in order to stop this conflict forever. Let the investors make the workers shareholders. Give them some of the shares of the company to them. But not by force. But because they are spiritually regenerated now, let them give it for the sake of God. So that everybody that then works in that company will be the shareholder. Some of them naturally who have invested will have greater number of shares, but workers will have a fair number of shares as well. So that not only they will get wages, but also they will be at the end of the day getting dividends from the profits of the company as well. He said that in that way there will be no conflict because everybody is shareholder. You see, there are spiritual solutions to this problem from God. Okay. Other con conflicts happens because of clash of personalities. The problem between individuals. It's not for money only. But again, that has got a spiritual sh solution. Bahala, Abdul Baha, they tell us when you look at somebody, you must, no matter who it is, you must always think that that somebody is much higher than yourself. Be courteous. Be, uh, you know, uh, humble. Then the problem will not arise. You see, a lot of these problems should not arise to begin with. Rather than let it come to uh, uh, the conflict, situation and try to resolve it. He said, Baha, Abdul Baha said, whenever there is a conflict arises, you immediately forget and forgive. Don't do it for the sake of individuals. Do, do it for the sake of God. Then you will get your reward from God as well. All right, now let's go back to the uh, institution of the Baha'i House of Worship, or another simpler word, Baha'i Temple. Or if you want the Arabic of it, Mashrqul Askar, the dawning place of the worship of God. You see, a lot of problems is going to be solved if you listen carefully to this uh, lesson here that we are going to study together. Uh, I'm just going to get some more pens. Now, the Baha'u'llah in his moly, most holy book, the Kitab Baghdad says that in every village, every town, every city, you are going to build a Baha'i temple. And usually all the Baha'i temples have got nine doors. It doesn't matter how big or small they are. All right, one door. Can you see this? 
All right, do it like that. One door, two doors, three door, four door, five door, six door, seven, eight door, nine door. So the houses of worship, they have got nine doors to admit all the religions. It's not for Baha'is. Every house of worship that Baha'is build is a present to humanity for the sake of every human being on this planet. Everybody can re go there and read their own scriptures. Now listen to this. I don't even say you can go and read whatever they like there. Muslims can come and read Quran there. Uh, Christians can come and read the New Testament there. Uh, Jews can come there and read the Old Testament there. And pray to God. It's all accepted. Including the Baha'i Holy Scripture. And all the other Baha'i uh, Holy Scriptures. Now, it has got nine doors to admit everybody. Now, when you read the writings of the Baha'i faith, it says it is an obligation, obligation, a duty, to get up in the morning. Uh, let's, I, let's amplify that. What time? It says, at dawn. What time is dawn? Yes? Anybody? Dawn? Before sunrise. When the uh, first glimmer of the light appears, before the sun rises. At dawn. What time is the dawn at the moment? We are in, o in month of August 1999. Well, I don't know. About what time? About, let's say, 5 o'clock. Would I be correct to say that? For example, 5 a.m. is sunrise. Now, Baha'u'llah says there, go to the uh, uh, Baha'i temple for prayer at dawn. Now, that means before 5 o'clock. However, until two hours after sunrise, you can do that. From the dawn until two hours after sunrise. Let's say that you are very disciplined and you are strict with yourself and you want to go there first thing before 5 o'clock, before sunrise. So you go there, suppose you go there 4.30 a.m. Just think about it. Baha'u'llah wants to revolutionize the life of this planet. Now, everything starts with the prayer and the worship and the praise of God. He says, get up before sunrise. That's very important. He's, we are going to see this being implemented in more and more countries gradually. If you are strict with yourself, you want to follow Baha'u'llah, you try to be at the temple at 4.30. For the reasons that I'm going to tell you a little later, you're not going to go back home <laughs> after prayer. So you should have got up uh, earlier than 4.30 and have had a wash and you have had a, uh, some a breakfast before you go there for prayer. So that means at least, at least, you have to wake up and get up at 4 a.m., even if you are very close to the temple 
and you can wash and have a little breakfast very quickly in half an hour, which is not always possible. Now, the conclusion is fast, fantastic, you know, fascinating. We, he, we know that usually they recommend, the doctors recommend, if you want to have a healthy life, you have to have a good eight hours sleep. I'm not going to argue with anybody who says, no, I just need seven hours. Or somebody who says, I want nine hours. It's up to them, but this is what they say. You have to have eight hours of sleep. Now, if you want to get up at 4 a.m., and you want to have, you have, you should have had eight hours of good sleep, what time should you have gone to bed then? And I slept, really seriously, to sleep, 8 a.m., 8 p.m., the following, the previous night, isn't it? You see the way God changes the life of people. So, now, this is a, personal view that I'm saying, going to say to you. If you go and really to bed before 8, so that at 8 o'clock, 8 p.m., you're asleep with the intention of getting up at 4 a.m., think about it. How this is going to revolutionize the way for the life of people on this planet? Because I don't know why it is so, but all the crimes happened between 8 o'clock at night until sunrise, didn't it? And a lot of energy, meaning electricity and all that, is wasted at that time. However, having said that, this is the way Baha'u'llah says it. You get up, suppose if you want to be disciplined at 4, so you go to sleep at 8 the previous night. You get up and wash and have a breakfast and go at 5 a.m. or before it, or after it a little, to the temple for, in your town or your village or your uh, city for the worship of God, one true God. That's the first thing, pray. Now, the next bit is very important. In the Baha'i writings, we say the worship of God, as far as prayer is concerned, is half of it. Half the worship is prayer. But then, having had got up and said your prayer at the temple, you're not going to go home. You come out, and the first building there, outside, round the temple, is a complex. The first place is research and development offices and labs. Because if you want to start establish a more advanced civilization, meaning improve the conditions of life, invent much better way of, uh, I don't know, heating, lighting, uh, transport, everything else, you have to have a very good research and development place. It's indispensable. It is essential, 100%. You can't improve the conditions of the people without more research and development existing in every town, in every city, in every uh, city and town, in the, all the countries of the world. And according to the Baha'i faith, all these research and development uh, uh, projects should be linked to all the other research and pro uh, development uh, places of all the other cities and countries of the world, because they are all your brothers and sisters. You share with them. 
You don't monopolize it. Anybody who's been to this research and development place, you know, at one side of it, you have to have a technical college, At one side of it, you have to have a teaching hospital. So in the Baha'i scheme of thing, you come out, either you find job in research and development, or you have a job in the college, or you are studying if you are young in the college, or you are working at the teaching hospital, or working there, or studying there, or you are a sick person there. Now, Baha'u'llah has said that any work that you do is equivalent to the worship of God. So by going and praising the Lord and praying there, if you don't after it going and do something, you have missed half of it. Half the true worship you have missed. Half is praying, half of it is doing. Doesn't matter what your job you do. When we look at the Baha'i world volumes that are there, and I've shared it with you, that's where I get this from. The next one is, Baha'u'llah says it has to be uh, an inn for the travelers. Is that correct? Anybody comes to town, to the village, to the wherever, you need a traveler's place to stay. You need university. You need school. You need for emergency cases orphanage. You need place for administration. Admin, administration of the top, town. The uh, lighting, heating, uh, what's it, streets, roads, everything there. Managing all the affairs of the town. What else do you need? Yes? Oh, yes. Old people's home. You must care for the elderly. What else do you need? I don't know. The, suppose uh, police. Because Baha'u'llah says you need to have a minimum of police force to control law and order, enforce law and order. Anyway, while you are meditating on this subject, you can add as many buildings as you want. These are the basic things. So what is the important thing is, when you have said your prayer and meditation there, then you come out and you go work in any of these, and that is the half the worship. It's a worship equivalent to the worship of God. You can't go home. And it is the responsibility of the Baha'i institutions, including a spiritual assembly, to find you a job in one of these. That's why I'm saying, with this way, you are going to solve the economic problem as well. There is no, never, not going to be a poverty in the Baha'i community, because everybody will be given a job. However, Maybe some clever person is listening to me who is an economist here, but economist of the old order, not the new world order. What the economists tell you, I'm a, a management accountant, 
All right? When you have gone to university, I've studied economy. The economists tell you that if you get full employment, you're going to have inflation. Why? Because the uh, supply of goods and services is limited. And if everybody universally demand goods and services, because they are scarce, there is going to be inflation. Which, that is not applicable to the new world order. Why? Because one of the teachings of God in this age is to avoid luxury, to avoid excess. Baha'u'llah, the Bab, Abdul Baha, Shoghi Afandi, even at those times that they had plenty of money, vast sums of money at their disposal, either because they had inherited it or because uh, the followers of them send it to them as the right of God or contribution to the funds of the Baha'i faith. Although they had these vast sums of money, they lived frugally. And they advocated a fruit, not the life of poverty, but only to satisfy the real immediate need. That does not mean, Baha'u'llah never said that it is forbidden to go and work until you earn millions. It doesn't matter. You can earn millions. But then he said, spend those millions for the good of people. And be detached from it. Having all these things, then Baha'u'llah in his tablets revealed after 1873, after he revealed the Kitab Aqdas, the most holy book in 18. Uh, 73, he revealed his tablets that in those tablets, if you have I've given, I've shown you that book, it's called Tablets of Baha'u'llah after the revelation of the Kitab Aghdar, which I showed you at the first session. Then he says, in every town, every city, the first necessary thing is to develop agriculture. You see, manifestation of God knows better than everybody else that the first thing you need is to eat. But he is saying that every town, every village has to be self-sufficient as much as possible. So you have to Develop agriculture. That means all the production of the food, including dairy products and, uh, you know, look, having, raising uh, sheep and beef, you know, uh, etc. Et all the food production, agriculture, it has to be delivered. First, he says. Next, he says you must develop industries. Number two, industries. Then he says you must develop. Why? Because here I said as much as possible you have to provide your own food. But sometimes, if you are located in certain geographical places, it's not possible to provide all your food. So you have to develop uh, trade and commerce. This is one of the third importance Baha'u'llah has given in his uh, revelation. 
And finally, then he says, you must develop arts and crafts. Again, whether you're working in all these institutions or in agriculture, in industry, in trade and commerce, in arts and crafts, that is the worship of God as well. All work is the worship of God. And Baha'u'llah emphatically, clearly writes that when you reach the age of, age of the consent, age of the uh, maturity, you need wealth. He says, he says it himself. He said, you need wealth. But you have to acquire wealth through work. Yes, we said before that Abdul Baha explained that everybody's capacity differs. Everybody's constitution differs. But it doesn't matter what capacity God has given you, whether through your body or through your spirit and soul, you will find in all these uh, areas that Baha'u'llah has given you a, a place for yourself to develop them and work them. The only thing that Abdul Baha emphasizes is that whatever you do it, do it best, do it the best way possible. Do it like you are worshiping God. In this way, you can acquire wealth, and also you will uh, be able to use that wealth for the sake of God. And also, you are not idle, which is the worst sin in the world. And it's going to create wealth for all nations, and it is going to get rid of the unemployment. and it's going to solve the economic problem. The institution of the Mashrakal Azkar. The forward is by Horace Holly. And first there is a quotation from the Kitabi Akdas by Baha'u'llah. Blessed is he who at the hour of dawn centering his thoughts on God occupied by his remembrance and supplicating his forgiveness directeth his steps to the Mashakal Asgar and entering therein seateth himself in silence to listen to the verses of God the sovereign the mighty the all praised say the Mashakal Asgar is each and every building which hath been erected in cities and villages for the celebration of my praise. Such is the name by which it hath been designated before the throne of glory, were ye of those who understand. The forward starts. Many discerning minds have testified to the profoundly significant change which has taken place during recent years in the character of popular religious thinking. Religion has developed an entirely new emphasis, more especially for the layman, quite independent of the older sectarian divisions. Instead of considering that religion is a matter of turning towards an abstract creed, the average religionist today is concerned with the practical applications of religion to the problems of human life. Religion, in brief, after having apparently lost its influence in terms of theology, has been restored more powerfully than ever as a spirit of brotherhood an impulse towards unity, 
and an ideal making for a more enlightened civilization throughout the world. Against this background, the institution of the magical Askar stands revealed as the supreme expression of all those modern religious tendencies animated by social ideals which do not repudiate the reality of spiritual experience but seek to transform it into a dynamic, thriving, striving for unity. The Mashrakal Azka, when clearly understood, gives the world its most potent agency for applying mystical vision or idealistic aspiration to the service of humanity. It makes visible and concrete those deeper meanings and wider possibilities of religion which could not be realized until the dawn of this universal age. The term Majrakul Askar means literally dawning place of the praise of God. To appreciate the significance of this Baha'i institution, we must lay aside all customary ideas of the churches and cathedrals of the past. The magical Askar fulfills the original intention of religion in each dispensation before that intention had become altered and veiled by human intervention, human invention and belief. The Mashrakal Aska is a channel releasing spiritual powers for social regeneration because it fills a different function than that assumed by the sectarian church. Its essential purpose is to provide a community meeting place for all who are seeking to worship God and achieves this purpose by interposing no man-made veils between the worshipper and the supreme. Thus, the magical Askar is freely open to people of all faiths on equal terms who now realize the universality of Baha'u'llah in revealing the oneness of all the prophets. Moreover, since the Baha'i faith has no professional clergy, the worshipper entering the temple hears no sermon and takes part in no ritual, the emotional effect of which is to establish a separate group consciousness. Integral with the temple are its accessory buildings, without which the magical Askar could not be a complete social institution. These buildings are to be devoted to such activities as a school for science, a hospice, a hospital, an asylum for orphans. Here the circle of spiritual experience at last joins as prayer and worship are allied directly to creative service eliminating the static, subjective elements from religion and laying a foundation for a new and higher type of human association. The spiritual significance of the Mashakal Askar, a letter from Shogi Effendi. It should be borne in mind that the central edifice of the magical Askar, round which in the fullness of time shall cluster such institutions of social service as shall afford relief to the suffering, sustenance to the poor, shelter to the wayfarer, solace to the bereaved, and education to the ignorant, should be regarded apart from these dependencies as a house solely designated and entirely dedicated to the worship of God in accordance with the few yet definitely prescribed principles established by Baha'u'llah 
in the Kitab i Akdas. It should not be inferred, however, from this general statement that the in interior of the central edifice itself will be converted into a conglomeration of religious services conducted along lines associated with the traditional procedure obtaining in churches, mosques, synagogues, and other temples of worship. Its various avenues of approach, all converging toward the central hall beneath its dome, will not serve as admittance to those sectarian adherents of rigid formulae and man-made creeds, each bent according to his way to observe his rites, recite his prayers, perform his ablutions, and display the particular symbols of his faith within separated defined sections of Baha'u'llah's universal house of worship. Far from the Mashrigal Askars offering such a spectacle of incoherent and confusing sectarian observances and rites, a condition wholly incompatible with the pro provisions of the Akdas and irre irreconcilable with the spirit it inculcates, the central house of Baha'i worship enshrined within the magical Askar will gather within its chastened walls in a serenely spiritual atmosphere only those who, discarding forever the trappings of elaborate and ostentatious ceremony, are willing worshippers of the one true God, as manifested in this age in the person of Baha'u'llah. To them will the magical Askar symbolize the fundamental verity underlying the Baha'i faith, that religious truth is not absolute but relative, that divine revelation is not final but progressive. Theirs will be the conviction that an all-loving and ever-watchful father, who in the past and at various stages in the evolution of mankind has sent forth his prophets as the bearers of his, his, his message and the manifestations of his light to mankind cannot at this critical period of their civilization withhold from his children the guidance which they sorely need amid the darkness which has beset them and which neither the light of science nor that of human intellect and wisdom can succeed in dissipating. And thus, having recognized in Baha'u'llah the source whence this celestial light proceeds, they will irresistibly feel attracted to seek the shelter of his house and congregate therein, unhampered by ceremonials and unfettered by creed, to render homage to the one true God, the essence and orb of eternal truth, and to exalt and magnify the name of his messengers and prophets who, from time immemorial, even until our day, have, under diverse circumstances and in varying measure, mirrored forth to a dark and wayward world the light of heavenly guidance. But however inspiring the conception of Baha'i worship, as witnessed in the central edifice of this exalted temple, it cannot be regarded as the sole, nor even the essential factor in the part which the Mashrigal Askar, as designed by Baha'u'llah, is destined to play in the organic life of the Baha'i community. Divorced from the social human, divorced from the social humanitarian, educational, and scientific pursuits centering around the dependencies of the magical Ashkar. Baha'i worship, however, exalts, exalted in its conception. However passionate in fervor, can never hope to achieve beyond the meager and often transitory 
results produced by the content contemplations of the ascetic or the communion of the passive worshipper. It cannot afford lasting satisfaction and benefit to the worshipper himself, much less to humanity in general, unless and until translated and transfused into that dynamic and disinterested service to the cause of humanity, which it is the supreme privilege of the dependencies of the magical Askar to facilitate and promote. Nor will the exertions, no matter how disinterested and strenuous, of those who within the precincts of the magical Askar will be engaged in administering the affairs of the future Baha'i Commonwealth, fructify and prosper unless they are brought into close and daily communion with those spiritual agencies centering in the radiating, centering in and radiating from the central shrine of the magical Askar. Nothing short of direct and constant interaction between the spiritual forces emanating from this house of worship, centering in the heart of the magical Askar, and the energies consciously displayed by those who administer its affairs in their service to humanity can possibly provide the necessary agency capable of removing the ills that have so long and so grievously afflicted humanity. For it is assuredly upon the consciousness of the e efficacy of the revelation of Baha'u'llah, reinforced on one hand by spiritual communion with his spirit and on the other by the intelligent application and the faithful execution of his principles and laws that he revealed that the salvation of a world in travail must ultimately depend. And of all the institutions that stand associated with his holy name, surely none save the institution of the magical Askar can more adequately provide the essentials for Baha'i worship and service, both so vital to the regeneration of the world. Therein lies the secret of the loftiness, of the potency, of the unique position of the magical Askar as one of the outstanding institutions conceived by Baha'u'llah. 25th of October, 1929. Now, dear friends, uh, you heard uh, David reading from the uh, Baha'i uh, World Volume uh, 1988 to 1992, and uh, he read these uh, two uh, articles, one by Horace Holy and, and then by our beloved guardian, Shoghi Afandi, um, naturally, you realize that it is difficult for uh, a person who does not speak the uh, Arabic language to pronounce the word mashriq al askar, <laughs> uh, you know, precisely. So, you know, anyway, the right one in Arabic is mashriq al askar, or, or the dawning place of the worship of God, or Baha'i temple or the institution of the Baha'i House of Worship. Uh, so you know the reference where it has come from. You can refer to it now in case you want it. However, in other Baha'i world volumes that you may come across, you may be able to find exactly the same two articles as well. Now, dear friends, we are going to go back to this uh, mm, 
the world, a new world order, Baha'i system of administration. And then if you remembered, we talked that everything has to be based on the holy scriptures. And then we have uh, the universal house of justice with us now. Uh, that is by the by Baha'u'llah, uh, and he has said that they are infallible. So we are getting infallible guidance from the Universal House of Justice. What I am going to do now, I am going to do the last uh, part of about the Baha'i administrative system order. And that is the process of decision making by the Universal House of Justice. However, in order to do that, I have to first talk to you about the building of the ark on the mountain of God, on Mount Carmel in Haifa in Israel. Let's go here now. You see, dear friends, we are uh, building the world administrative center of the faith of the cause of God, Baha'u'llah, on earth, in Haifa, on Mount Carmel. Now, for your information, uh, do you see anything that ends, any word that ends with I-L or E-L in the Hebrew? It, it means God. So, uh, Carmel means the Garden of God. We are building the Garden of God, the world center of God on earth from where the commandments and the law of God is given to the nations of the world. And we have here on the Mount Carmel, the seat of the Universal House of Justice, which if you remember the earlier sessions, it was uh, built and was ready uh, in 1980s. And that started the building of the ark. However, before that, Shoghi Afandi, the guardian, had already built the International Archives. where the writings of, of uh, Baha'u'llah, Abdul Baha, uh, Shoghi Afandi, the Bab, they are all kept with the relics and anything of historical value there. And then, according to the uh, instructions and the charter, that the beloved guardian had given to Universal House of Justice, and of course, three other, uh, two other main documents. One of these main documents is the Tablet of Baha'u'llah. It's called the Tablet of Carmel, which in a few minutes' time, I'm going to read that for you. 
That was a charter from Baha'u'llah, a mandate from uh, Baha'u'llah, a prophecy from Baha'u'llah, that on this Mount Karmel, God is going to establish his rule. And then in the tablets of the uh, Baha'u'llah, uh, which we call that the will and testament of Baha'u'llah. That is again another charter uh, for developing the uh, uh, world center of the Baha'i faith on Mount Karma. So what I'm trying to say, the Universal House of Justice, our be beloved supreme institutions, didn't just sit there and think, oh, what shall we do? Let's build these buildings. These are the uh, uh, buildings that we are going to complete the arc, which uh, I'm coming to it in a second. The next building here that is already built now is center for the study of the holy text. And there is an annex to international uh, archives being built now and it's called the annex to international archives and here is nearly completed a building for the seat of the International Teaching Center. Which we talked about before. And then, a little later on, we are going to have, there is a place for it, we are going to have the International Library. This we call it in the Baha'i world, the Ark. Which, for those of you who is into the study of the Holy Bible, you may be familiar with it. It also represents Ark with this way. You see, if you have the ark like this, and you have it written that way. The ark is a shape, but this ark, it goes back to the early Old Testament time, of the time of Noah, who built that ark, which is a metaphor, a simile, a allegorical, saying that those people who turn to the ark, to the ark of God, they come to the salvation. They will become protected from the flood of materialism 
and the decadence of the society around us. They become protected. We read in the Baha'i writings that the universal house of justice is the last refuge of a tottering civilization. Everything is crumbling. And it has to be so, because everything else represents the old order, and now we are establishing a new world order. While everybody is trying to solve the innumerable problems facing mankind on this planet, Baha'is, by the command of the Lord, through the revelation of the Lord, through the glory of God, Baha'u'llah, are building the ark of salvation for protection of humanity, ready so that when they have no other refuge to go to, to turn to the uh, Ark of God, to enter the art of, Ark of God and to be saved. Now, these buildings, just for your information, are built in such a way that one section of it is above the land, but there are many stories under the rock. Many stories under the uh, rock. Because, if you know that this Mount Carmel is a rock, very rock, full of rock, in order to uh, put all the revealed word of God, the holy scriptures of the Baha'i faith, they had to build a few flows, few stories, and they dig the a mountain to hold all the writings there and to be protected that any, in any case of any troubles nothing can penetrate these. And also for your information I said that there is a passage underneath all of them that they connect this passage, this passageway all of them together. Now, I'm just going to mention this, that on the Mount Carmel also, here a little distance that way, you have the uh, shrine of the Baal, Shrine of the Bab, where the remains of the Bab, after his martyrdom, was brought and laid down on Mount Carmel, according to the instructions of Baha'u'llah. And in that Shrine of the Bab, also Abdul Baha is laid to rest. But the resting place of Baha'u'llah is outside the city of Akka the other side of the bay of Akka. One side is Haifa, the other side is Akka, and Baha'u'llah is uh, laid to rest in the mansion of, uh, next to the mansion of Bahji in uh, Akka. And also I must say this, that 
the guardian of the faith brought the remains of the uh, uh, the most holy leaf, the wife of Baha'u'llah, and made a resting place for her on Mount Carmel, as well as the uh, younger brother of Baha'u'llah, the purest branch, Mirza Mehdi, and also you have the uh, resting place of the greatest holy leaf, the uh, sister of Abdul Baha here, and also you have the resting place of uh, holy mother, the wife of Abdul Baha on Mount Carmel as well. In the, these are, they, they are in, laid to rest in the memorial garden on Mount Carmel. So the Baal Shrine is where the Holy of Holies is buried, is the spiritual place there. This is where the administrative of the Baha'i faith is. And the burial of the Holy Family in this Mount Carmel is reinforces the spiritual potency of the place. Now that I've said this, I'm going now to talk about the function of it. Let's start with this, what I told you earlier. We want to study the process of decision making of the universal house of justice. Which with short you can say UHJ. Or some people they say the house. Because if I want to explain this process of decision making, it's going to take more time than we have tape for it. I'm just going to stop, change the tapes quickly, and continue this particular subject immediately after that. Now, we have been discussing the process of decision making of the Universal House of Justice. Uh, now, as you already know, there are nine members of the Universal House of Justice. And if we carefully examine the way they make decisions, probably it will help us, not probably, definitely it will help us in our process of decision making, in whatever level we uh, consult and want to make decisions. Now, when the Universal House of Justice want to make a decision, the first thing that they do, no, before I say that, I forgot something else to tell you. The Universal House of Justice have got nine members. 
they have decided for a spiritual reason, because they are a spiritually developed uh, s s uh, souls, that none of them is going to accept to become chairman permanently. So the chairmanship of the Universal House of Justice goes in rota. One member becomes the chairman in each period of time. They are completely uh, humble, spiritual, uh, detached, self-sacrificing. And from what two members of them have told me personally at meetings, one of the most important things that they make their consultation so perfect is that they are in love with each other. They are in love with the Lord first, of course, but they are in love with each other. Great respect and love they show each other. So nobody there say, assumes the, permanently the role of the chairman. They do not have a secretary. They don't have a uh, treasurer. Uh, the secretary, uh, the department of the secretary, they manage the uh, writing the minutes and the decisions of the Universal House of Justice. Now, when uh, they want to make a decision, at that level they are, from what we read in the Baha'i Journal in the UK, when they were going to start building the Ark, they said, Universal House of Justice first sends that question, that problem, to the center for the study of holy texts, where they have all the writings of the Bab, Baha'u'llah, Abdul Baha, Shoghi Afandi, and the decisions that Universal House of Justice made before. And they tell them to find anything that those holy beings have written to see if they have given any guidance about that particular subject or not. Just for your information, I must tell you that there are always nine permanent and nine visiting researchers working there. All the writings computerized. All the writings are for emergency cases, have put in microfiches. And all of them either kept a copy here or another place in the world, which we don't know where it is, that in case of some natural disaster or etc. happens, so that we always have the exact handwritten, handwritten the tablets of Baha'u'llah or tablets that sealed by Baha'u'llah, Abdul Baha Shoghi Afandi, there. We never lose it. So the problem goes to the Center for the Study of the Text. They furnish Universal House of Justice with all that has been told in the Holy Scriptures about that subject, and they submit it to our beloved Universal House of Justice. Then Universal House of, House of Justice, as I is explained to you through their arms, you know, the two arms they have, the national assemblies and through them local assemblies, and 
also uh, through the International Teaching Center, Continental Board of Counselors, Auxiliary Board Member, Assistant Auxiliary Board Members, they have the overview of what's going on in the whole Baha'i world. So, you see, everything that they have to decide is going to affect the Baha'i uh, international community. Therefore, they have to know if the decision make, they make, how is it going to affect that Baha'i world community? Are the people ready for it? Aren't the people for, not ready for it? Then there, at the moment, uh, the building itself is not there, but there are officers. I mean, eventually we are going to say anything that we get in international library, we get all the information about the faith and about the condition of people in the whole world today. From teaching, international teaching center and from the uh, national assemblies, you are going to get all the information within the Baha'i faith through the international library and all the offices of the Universal House of Justice in New York, in the United Nations, in uh, Nairobi, in Geneva, uh, in Jerusalem, in other offices that they have all over the board, they are going to get what's going on in the world, outside the Baha'i faith. Because they are for the guidance of the whole humanity, not just for Baha'is. <coughs> So, they have then the full information from the holy writings. They have got the full information from the Baha'i community, international community. They get the full information of the uh, world conditions. And then they pray, meditate, and then through the inspiration that comes to them from God, they make their decision which is infallible. And we have been told that in the case of Universal House of Justice, they always consult and consult and gather information and pray so that every decision that they make is their decision of all the members. It's unanimous. And they are not going to rush anything they are going to consult as long as it takes until they get a unanimous agreement of, of all the members. Now, these are lessons for us to, uh, you know, take on board. No chairman, no boss there, nobody telling each other what to do. There is absolute love, harmony, respect between the members. 
they get all the information from the holy writings, from the center for the study of the text. They get full information about the Baha'i world. They get the full information from the world condition outside the Baha'i world. They pray, they meditate, and it, it takes as long as it takes, necessary to take, without rushing it, to decide upon something that they are inspired by God. Once they have decided about a matter, they have two instruments. Well, they have many instruments, but mainly the International Teaching Center and all the national uh, spiritual assemblies of the world to implement their decisions. And naturally, national assemblies will guide the local assemblies. The International Teaching Center will guide the Continental Board of Councillors, which in turn they guide the uh, Auxiliary Board member, which in turn they uh, guide the uh, uh, Assistant Auxiliary Board member to implement the, decision of the decisions of the Universal House of Justice. Having said that, from what we have been told, because they have the full information about the Baha'i world community and the uh, world condition outside the Baha'i community, it does not mean that always when they make a decision that it is going to be carried out in every place, in every village, in every country in the world the same way and at the same time. Sometimes when they make a decision, they, they may implement it in one or two or three or five countries first. Maybe it will take some time before other com countries are in a position to, do it, to implement it and then uh, again, some other countries, maybe much later. It depends on the maturity, the number of Baha'is, the conditions of the life in that particular country. So, dear friends, having said that, now you can yourself look at this uh, World Order of Baha'u'llah summary here and the structure and you will find that I have covered every subject on this sheet of paper either during these session, sessions just now or in the sessions before. If still you are not quite clear about any particular section of this, I've told you that maybe some people still will have 5% of their question not answered, which our address is on top of your pages of your course notes with the address, telephone number, you get in touch with us by phone or write to us. We will send you the relevant information from the Holy Scriptures to clarify and from Baha'i writings. I'm going to end the word order of Baha'u'llah now. Now, dear friends, we discussed in detail about the institution of the Baha'i House of Worship or simply Baha'i Temple. We discussed about the Ark on the Mount Carmel from uh, where this place, the law of 
God is going to be spread abroad and uh, guidance to be given to mankind. And we talked about the different buildings in that ark. And now, just before I finish this topic, I would like to show you uh, some pictures and photos uh, relating to what I have been talking about. But before I show you the picture of the, uh, mm, uh, the temples and the, uh, the ark buildings on Mount Carmel, I want first for you to focus on this map here. And those of you that are good in geography, you will immediately recognize uh, that we are focusing mainly on the Middle East. So here we have Persia, Iran, and Baha'u'llah is from the north of Iran. After he f followed the Baal, and at the time of extreme difficulties and persecutions of the Baha'is, Baha'u'llah was exiled from Iran to Iraq. So he lived for approximately 10 years in Iraq. And most of that time, eight years of that time, he was living in Baghdad with the exception of those two years that he was in the uh, mountains of Kurdistan. And then he was exiled again from Baghdad to Adrianople, sorry, to Istanbul, which at that time Istanbul was the capital of the Turkish Empire there. And after four months from there, he was exiled to Adrianople. Now, this Adrianople is on the Europe, in Europe, you know, in Europe. And his Baha'u'llah stayed there from 1863 to 1868. And then again, he was exiled from Adrianapol to the to Akka in uh, Palestine. And then he is laid to rest in Ak near Akka, adjacent to the mansion of Bahji in Akka. This is the point of adoration. This is where we face when we want to say our prayers. But the Mount Carmel is in Haifa, where Baha'u'llah instructed Abdul Baha to uh, build the shrine of the Bab and lay to rest the remains of the Bab on Mount Carmel, the mountain of God in Haifa. So, Palestine, uh, Haifa, Akka, and all those places that Baha'u'llah and Abdul Baha lived are holy to the Baha'is. It is the holy land. And while we are on this page, I want to, you to focus on this here, picture here. This is the gardens of the mansion of Bahji, the big building here. And the next building to it is the shrine of the Bab, where, uh, the shrine of the Baha'u'llah, where Baha'u'llah was laid to rest there after his ascension.
and there are such magnificent gardens have been built there around this. Now, again, before I go any further, I want to show you now uh, you see, when the revelation of God came to Baha'u'llah, he usually would uh, recite that, either than he himself or his uh, secretary would, would write down the revelation as it came through him. But they were so fast that when we look at the first writing of the revelation, it was so fast that uh, you can hardly read what uh, is being revealed. And this is a sample of the way on big sheets of paper with ink, the revelation of God was recorded on paper. See? It, don't think that because you don't know Persian or Arabic, you cannot understand this. Even Persians and uh, Arabs can't understand it either. Because it came so fast to him. Just to understand how fast, I'm going to show you this book of Baha'u'llah in a second just now. You see, we said one of the most significant books revealed by Baha'u'llah at the very beginning in Baghdad is the Kitab Iran or the Book of Certitude. Now, if you look, that's the book. But this book has been revealed in 48 hours. You see, the manifestation of God doesn't sit and think and then write a sentence and alter it and amend it and modify it. The revelation comes to him and he just writes it down. Then, after the tablet has been revealed by, from God through the manifestation of God, in that fashion that I told you, then it is transcribed properly in good handwriting. And some people who are very good in uh, calligraphy and this is a sample of the first page of the Kitab Iran, the book of certitude that I just showed you the translation of it in English. All right. Now, we were talking about the ark. I'm going to show you now uh, First, I want you to look at the shrine of the Bab on Mount Carmel, where Bab was laid to rest at the command of Baha'u'llah. However, in order to get the full picture of the Mount Carmel, I am going to show you this photo. It's better to put it this way, indeed.
All right? While you're looking at that, you see, this is the Mount Karma. It's going up here. This is from this uh, Haifa, the town. And these are terraces, nine terraces that is built below the shrine of the Bab, which continues to the road that leads to the sea. The uh, Bay of Acre, Mediterranean Sea. And then you cannot see it here, but up the mountain, above the shrine of the Bab, you are also going to get nine terraces, the same as the one below, until you get to the top of the mountain. Now, these nine terraces up and nine terraces down are 18 together. These are the going to be in the name of the first 18 believers in the Baal, which with the Baal himself in the middle makes it 19. And that 19 makes the unity. OK. Now, this booklet, by the way, that I showed you this from, it's been published by the mayor of Haifa, not by Baha'is. And I just want to show you the picture you know, of the mayor of Haifa. And you see the picture of the mayor of Haifa. Now I'm going to read what he's written. He says, his name, Amram Mitzana, not Mitzna, mayor of Haifa. He says, the city of Haifa, the capital of the north of Israel, invites you to share and enjoy all the advantages a mountain city by the sea can offer. It is situated on a broad natural harbor with a wide strip of golden sand, the beaches along the waterfront, and is surrounded by the green hills of the Carmel Park. Fulfill all your dreams of a perfect holiday, he says. For the culture seekers, there are museums, theaters, concert halls, and cinemas. For those who prefer fun and leisure, there are shopping malls, sports, and recreation centers. On top of it all, this is what Mayer said, the eighth wonder of the world the Baha'i gardens surrounding the monument and monumental shrine of the Bab, magnificently designed 19 terraces gently glide towards the uh, quarter of the German colony. Now, this is significant because if you remember in earlier sessions, I told you that the German Templars left Germany, sold all they had. They went at the bottom of the Mount Carmel, built their houses, waiting for the promised one to come. And it's still, it's called the German colony there. And on the top of the you know, entrance of the house, it says, uh, the coming of the Lord is near. They were waiting for Baha'u'llah to come. 
So he's saying that Baha'is are now building the ninth wonder of the world on Mount Kalman. You see, you can now have a quick glimpse of some views of the shrine from different angles. And then This is the way you can see the shrine if you stay at the bottom of the Mount Karma uh, at night. And you can see the, mount, uh, the shrine of the Bob right at, on the top. And then again, these are some landscapes and parts of the gardens on the Mount Karma. This is again another uh, picture of the Mount Carmel and the Shrine of the Bab at night in Haifa. And now I want to show you this part, because when you continue from the Mount Carmel, then you come to this street, which is at the sides of it is the German colony, where those German Templars came and stayed. And this road is leads you eventually to Mediterranean Sea. And according to the Baha'i writings, all the rulers of the world are going to come and walk this path and go for pilgrimage to the uh, shrine of the Baal. And then go to the shrine of Baha'u'llah in Akka. And then, of course, go to the adjacent building, which is the Universal House of Justice, to pay their respects. Now, we were talking in the last session about the building of the Universal House of Justice. And now, if you look at this middle picture here, Yes, this is the seat of the Universal House of Justice, made with most exquisite, wonderful marbles. And then if you just look at the, the left of it, is the center for the study of the text, which we discussed. We said there are always nine uh, 
permanent researchers and nine uh, nine uh, uh, visiting researchers there. And then if you go up here, you can see the shrine of the Bab there, but this is the archives, international archives building that I was talking to you in the last session. And then if you come, the, look at the below, it is a more fuller picture of the uh, center for the study of the text. In the Baha'i world, 1997-1998, we have a nice picture. If you can see this photo here, uh, now you can see the shrine of the Bab in the middle the construction of the nine terraces below it, which leads to the German uh, colony and then leads to Mediterranean below, and then nine terraces above it under construction. Now, I want you just, uh, it's for the blessing of it, to focus on this picture here. Yeah. Now, this is the room in the house of the Bab in Shiraz, in southern Iran, where in this room he declared to be the promised one. In the, on the 23rd of May, 1844. Now, if you focus on this small picture here, you can see uh, in this is the interior inside the prison cell of Baha'u'llah in the prison city of Akka. This is another portrait of Abdul Baha, if you focus on that. When he was older, and if you focus on this picture, which is an old picture, this is uh, during 19. 12, when Abdul Baha was visiting the United States and Canada, this is a banquet in his honor. Yes? Please focus on this picture down here, uh, 
Yes. Now, this is the International Baha'i Convention on Mount Carmel, where the members of all the national assemblies of the world, they come together to vote and to consult and elect the members of the Universal House of Justice from all nationalities, from five continents of the world. And finally, I want just to show you, we were talking about the Mashiach al God, the dawning point of the worship of God, the, the Baha'i Temple, the institution of the Baha'i House of Worship, and I'm just showing you some photographs of them in different continents. If we start from the top one here, this is the top one, is the house of worship in Western Samoa. Next is the House of Worship in Germany, in Frankfurt. Next is the House of Worship in Panama in South Af America. Next, this house of worship, which is in the form of the lotus flower, is the Baha'i worship of India, in New Delhi. Next is the house of worship in uh, Uganda, the, in Kampala, in Africa. And if you come here, this is the boss of worship in, uh, uni in the United States, near Chicago, in Illinois. And then if you come here, you look, that's the Baha'i House of Worship in Sydney, in Australia. Well, I hope you've enjoyed a little looking at these uh, photos of these holy places, holy writing, and the uh, uh, Baha'i Houses of Worship. I'm going to stop now. Dear friends, I'm going now to go back to our syllabus there. Part three. You can see that we have discussed and understood now the 13 social principles. We have discussed in detail establishing what is a, a new world order entails, establishing in a more advanced civilization. What do we mean by that? We have together read and studied the seven candles of unity of Abdul Baha. We have discussed in the course of our discussion in the social, certain social principles about the unity in diversity. If, what, if you remember what I said was, Baha'i faith does not want to create a uniform a uniformity, meaning we do not want to change and 
uh, sort of get rid of the uh, uh, heritage of the people, of their culture, customs, uh, music, art, uh, the way they put clothes on, everything else. These are very beautiful and very good. What we say that these national, uh, different nationality, different uh, colors of their skin, these different uh, customs of having a different kind of food, a different kind of music, should not prevent people to, uh, to become united in one universal cause, in the cause of God. Therefore, what we say, we accept that there is going to be diversity all the time, but you are going to have unity in that diversity. Between diverse nations of the world, you are going to create unity with the power of God through the revelation of Baha'u'llah and the power of the Holy Spirit. And then we discussed in detail the blueprint for global governance. How are you going to choose and elect your the, the, house of justice or spiritual assembly in your own village, in your own town, in your own city, so that they can govern and make decisions. We have discussed how you are going to elect regional councils, so that they make decisions for the whole region. We have discussed how you elect the national assembly so that they make decisions for the whole country under juris their jurisdiction. How you're going to elect a, uh, un the Universal House of Justice, the supreme institution to look after the best interests of mankind on this planet. And we have talked about uh, consultation in the new world order. We have discussed about the, uh, the house of worship and the importance of prayer and meditation as well as uh, work which is equal to worship in the Baha'i faith. We talked then later in detail about the ARC, the Universal House of Justice, the International Convention, the National Assemblies, the National Convention, the Baha'i Councils, Spiritual Assemblies, Institution of the 19-Day Feast, which we said this is the right arm of the Universal House of Justice, of this blue, blueprint, or global governance, which these are decision makers, these are the rulers, and then we looked at the left hand, which is the learned for protection and propagation of the faith of God. We talked about the International Teaching Center, we talked about hand of the cause of God, we called talked about counselors. By the way, counselors is 2L. Yeah, counselors. We just talked about Continental Board of Counselors. We talked about auxiliary board members for protection and propagation. We talked about assistant auxiliary board members for propagation and protection and how they in turn report back and how they all get instructions from Universal House of Justice and then 
uh, feedback information to universal house objects. That is what we call the blueprint for the uh, in, uh, world governance. Therefore, if you go back to the uh, syllabus here, you can see that we have completed part three now. And we are now going to start, in a minute, part four. Systematic, planned actions to achieve goals. This is what we are going to do in the next session. Thank you very much. My dear friends, we are starting part four of our syllabus. The intention is, if you look at here, systematic planned actions to achieve goals. We have now understood that our purpose in life is to recognize the manifestation of God for our age, and to get trained by him so that we can develop our spiritual capacities for the uh, unlimited life, you know, infinite time that we are going to live in spiritual worlds of God, and then also to uh, establish a more advanced civilization on Earth. but a civilization that is going to come about by the influence of the Holy Spirit through the revelation of God for this age. And the ultimate purpose of which is to establish the kingdom of God on earth which reflects those qualities of the spiritual kingdom of God. So that the earth will reflect the attributes of heaven, of the uh, Malakut, the uh, kingdom of God. I'm going to ask Christine to read Two passages, uh, three passages for you. Two of these passages are from uh, the revelation of Baha'u'llah, and the last one is revealed by Abdul Baha for us. Please listen to the, these three passages before I continue. From the revelation of Baha'u'llah. To whatever place we may be banished, however great the tribulation we may suffer, they who are the people of God must, with fixed resolve and perfect confidence, keep their eyes directed towards the day spring of glory, and be busied in whatever may be conducive to the betterment of the world and the education of its peoples. All that hath befallen us in the past hath advanced the interests of our revelation and blazoned its fame. And all that may befall us in the future will have a like result. Cling ye with your inmost hearts to the cause of God, a cause that hath been sent down by him who is the ordainer, the all-wise. We have with the utmost kindliness and mercy, 
summoned and directed all peoples and nations to that which shall truly profit them. The day star of truth that shineth in its meridian splendor beareth us witness. They who are the people of God have no ambition except to revive the world, to ennoble its life and regenerate its peoples. Truthfulness and goodwill have at all times marked their relations with all men. Their outward conduct is but a reflection of their inward life, and their inward life a mirror of their outward conduct. No veil hideth or obscureth the verities on which their faith is established. Before the eyes of all men, these verities have been laid bare and can be, can be unmistakably recognized. Their very acts attest the truth of these words. Every discerning eye can, in this day, perceive the dawning light of God's revelation, and every attentive ear can recognize the voice that was heard from the burning bush. Such is the rushing of the waters of divine mercy, that he who is the dayspring of the signs of God and the revealer of the evidences of his glory is without veil or concealment associating and conversing with the peoples of the earth and its kindreds. How numerous are those who, with hearts intent upon malice, have sought our presence and departed from it loyal and loving friends. The portals of grace are wide open before the face of all men. In our outward dealings with them, we have treated alike the righteous and the sinner, that perchance the evildoer may attain the limitless ocean of divine forgiveness. Our name, the Concealer, hath shed such a light upon men that the froward hath imagined himself to be numbered with the pious. No man that seeketh us will we ever disappoint, neither shall he that hath set his face towards us be denied access unto our court. O friends, help ye the one true God, exalted be his glory, by your goodly deeds, by such conduct and character as shall be acceptable in his sight. He that seeketh to be a helper of God in this day, let him close his eyes to whatever he may possess and open them to the things of God. Let him cease to occupy himself with that which profiteth him and concern himself with that which shall exalt the all-compelling name of the Almighty. He should cleanse his heart from all evil passions and corrupt desires. For the fear of God is the weapon that can render him victorious, the primary instrument whereby he can achieve his purpose. The fear of God is the shield that defendeth his cause, the buckler that enableth his people to attain to victory. It is a standard that no man can abase, a force that no power can rival. By its aid and by the leave of him who is the Lord of hosts, they that have drawn nigh unto God have been able to subdue and conquer the citadels of the hearts of men. Gleanings, page 270 to 272. The second pas passage from the Revelation of Baha'u'llah. If it be your wish, O people, to know God and to discover the greatness of his might, look then upon me with mine own eyes, and not with the eyes of anyone besides me. Ye will otherwise be never capable of recognizing me, though ye ponder my cause as long as my kingdom endureth, 
and meditate upon all created things throughout the eternity of God, the sovereign Lord of all, the omnipotent, the ever-abiding, the all-wise. Thus have we manifested the truth of our revelation, that haply the people may be roused from their heedlessness and be of them that understand. Behold the low estate of these men who know full well how I have offered up mine own self and my kindred in the path of God and for the preservation of their faith in him. Who are well aware how mine enemies have compassed me about in the days when the hearts of men feared and trembled, the days when they hid themselves from the eyes of the loved ones of God and of his enemies and were busied in ensuring their own security and peace. We eventually succeeded in manifesting the cause of God and exalted it to so eminent a position that all the people, except those who cherished ill will in their hearts against this youth and joined partners with the Almighty, acknowledged the sovereignty of God and his mighty dominion. And yet, notwithstanding this revelation, whose influence hath pervaded all created things, and despite the brightness of this light, the like of which none of them hath ever beheld, witness how the people of the Bayan have denied and contended with me. Some have turned away from the path of God, rejected the authority of him in whom they had believed, and acted insolently towards God, the most powerful, the supreme protector, the most exalted, the most great. Others hesitated and halted in his path and regarded the cause of the creator in its inmost truth as invalid unless substantiated by the approval of him who was created through the operation of my will. Thus have their works come to naught, and yet they fail to perceive it. Among them is he who sought to measure God with the measure of his own self, and was so misled by the names of God as to rise up against me, who condemned me as one that deserved to be put to death, and who imputed to me the very offenses of which he himself was guilty. Where do, wherefore do I plead my grief and my sorrow to him who created me and entrusted me with his message? Unto him do I render thanks and praise for the things he hath ordained, for my loneliness and the anguish I suffer at the hands of these men who have strayed so far from him. I have patiently sustained and will continue to sustain the tribulation that touched me and will put my whole trust and confidence in God. Him will I supplicate, saying, Guide thy servants, O my Lord, unto the court of thy favour and bounty and suffer them not to be deprived of the wonders of thy grace and of thy manifold blessings. For they know not what thou hast ordained for them by virtue of thy mercy that encompasseth the whole of creation. Outwardly, O Lord, they are weak and helpless. Inwardly, they are but orphans. Thou art the all-bountiful, the munificent, the most exalted, the most great. Cast not, O my God, the fury of thy wrath upon them, and cause them to tarry until such time when the wonders of thy mercy will have been made manifest, that haply they may return unto thee and ask forgiveness of thee for the things they have committed against thee. Verily, thou art the forgiving, the all-merciful. Gleanings, pages 272 to 275. The final passage from the writings of Abdu'l-Bahá, 
published in The Star of the West, page 210, volume 3, March 1913 to September 1914. I wish for you heavenly happiness. I am praying that the confirmations of God may descend upon you, that you may become his servant, that you may go forth to save mankind from the bondage of this mortal world. I wish you to escape from the hell of materialism. Be not occupied with material things. Have no anxiety about your affairs. You are under the protection of Baha'u'llah in his service. Live in the spiritual world as I do. Think of nothing else. Now, dear friends, we are going to build a new world. We are going to establish the kingdom of God on earth. But first of all, we have to be trained ourselves. And that's why we are going through this course. Once we have found the purpose and meaning of life, then we are going to uh, share this uh, knowledge, uh, share this spirituality, share this uh, message of God with our family, with our friends, with the citizen in our uh, cities, with the, our countrymen in our country, and with all the peoples of the world. Because they are merely uh, the Im images of God as well. We've got a relation, strong relation, a spiritual relationship with every human being on this planet. But the way we do this is again not the way we like to do it ourselves. We will do it, as we said before, uh, according to the revelation of God. When we start uh, sharing the message of God, the revelation of God, with the people on this planet, we have to still do it in the way that we have been told by God through his revelation for this age, but also remembering how did the manifestation of God himself did it? This, we said the, the human spirit and soul is like a student here. The uh, whole physical universe is our classroom where we are going to get trained in. And then the God is not leaving us alone. Uh, he sends us the manifestations of God, the messengers of God, the prophets of God to guide us and train us. When they train us, they do it in two different ways. One, they give us the revelation of God. Secondly, by the way the manifestations of God, they live themselves, they dramatize for us how to live our lives, how to behave. That's why it is necessary to read the revelation of God and understand it and obey the commandments of God. And also it is necessary to read the account of the life of the manifestation of God, the account of life of the Baal, the account of life of, of Baha'u'llah, the account of life of Abdul Baha the account of life of Shog life of Shoghi Afandi, because by the way they live, they dramatize for us how to live. These manifestations of God didn't think about anything else except God. Didn't think about anything as being important besides fulfilling their mission. Now that we 
uh, have we are being trained to become spiritualized and follow them we have in turn have only to look at the way they did things and the, the way they have told us to do things so let's refresh our minds i've gone through this before but i just want to remind you we are people of the covenant From 1743 to 1825, we were listening to the uh, Ahmad when he was telling us about uh, the coming of the manifestation of God and to be get prepared for it. Then in, from 1793 to 1843, we listened to Kazem when he told us again how to be detached, become, become self-sacrificing, become spiritual enough to understand and recognize the manifestation of God, the Master, when He comes. Then, by the coming of the Bab, from 1844 to 1850, his, during his ministry, everybody had to obey the Bab. From in 1850, when Bob was martyred until 1892, if you wanted to know what to do, you turn to Baha'u'llah. From uh, 1892 until 1921, during the ministry of Abdul Baha, you had to see what Abdul Baha tells us to do. During the 36 years of ministry of Shoghi Afandi from 1921 to 1957, Guardian was directing the affairs of the world. And between 1957 until 1963, when the Universal House of Justice was first time elected, we were listening to the advice of the, and the guidance of the hands of the cause of God. And then from 1963 until the next manifestation of God, next prophet of God will come at least after 1,000 years, we are going to get our guidance of what to do from the Universal House of Justice. Now, during the time of the Bab, during the time of Baha'u'llah, during the time of Abdul Baha, 20,000 people got martyred for the sake of uh, teaching and sharing the message of the uh, God with the people in Persia, in Iran. And it hasn't still stopped yet, you know. The, from 1976 uh, until 1983 uh, and 4, uh, again, a number of Baha'is have been uh, killed. They have given their blood as witness, as a witnesses. That, look, people, this is the message of God. This is... Uh, what Jesus Christ our Lord had promised it's been fulfilled the spirit of truth has come now and for this reason only they were martyred for the reasons that I told you when I was explaining the veils the veil of knowledge the veil of the lust and leadership and the uh, position of the divines and the government officials. I'm not going to give you all the accounts of all the 20,000 martyrs, but I just want you to share with you a few pages only from the very recent martyrs of, from the 1970s to 1980s for you to see that these people who were from all classes of people you see, there were among them simple, 
a peasant lady, a young peasant lady, a wife of a small farmer, and then among them you see professors and doctors and surgeons and lawyers and teachers and lecturers as well. These are the people who understood the message of God and uh, 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 tried their best to inform and share the message of God with the people around them. And of course, before that, they had to spiritualize themselves, to be ready to sacrifice everything for the cause of God. Just look at these pictures that I'm going to show you just now. This is just a few pictures from the martyrs from 1978 to 20th April 1986, 78 to 86. Now, if you could focus, please, here. This is the account of the account of it in the Baha'i world and their name and the date of their martyrdom. Again, you can see their name, their date of their martyrdom. Men, women of all classes, from all backgrounds. These are the names, the date of their bar martyrdom. This is again their names and the date of their martyrdom in Iran. And now I want you to concentrate and just see the blessed faces of these witnesses that when promised one of all ages, the promised one of all religions comes on the earth to give the message of God, they believe in him, they are steadfast and they give their lives for him, for God and his cause to establish the kingdom of God on earth. Please go through this slowly and show every one of them.
these holy souls, they recognized the manifestation of God. They stood firm as witnesses on earth. And the most precious thing that they, a, a person may have, and that is their life, they were ready to give it. And when they wanted to kill them, they just said, just say you are not a Baha'i, we leave you alone. They said, no, I am a Baha'i. 